Life within a Confederate hospital was a harrowing experience for most patients. Thousands of soldiers suffered from a variety of disfiguring injuries, many of which made it difficult or impossible to lead an otherwise normal life. Their first introduction to hospital life began when they were carried from the field on stretchers and taken to small forward aid stations. There, assistant surgeons provided first aid to the wounded and routed cases on to field hospitals, which were temporary hospitals set up in tents or buildings behind the lines. The primary function of the field hospital was to receive wounded from the field, stabilize their condition, perform necessary amputations, and then evacuate them to general hospitals where they were treated and, if they didn't die, either discharged or returned to the army. The majority of soldiers arriving at field hospitals had wounds to their extremities. When bone damage was severe, amputation was the prescribed method of preventing a life-threatening infection, gangrene, or death. 75% of the wounds that soldiers received were to their extremities, either to their arms or to their legs. And 76% of the wounds were caused by the mini ball, this conical shaped bullet of soft lead. And what tended to happen is when the mini ball struck, it struck, if it struck bone, it didn't just fracture the bone as a musket ball might have done. It shattered the bone. It drove bone fragments into the surrounding area. And in addition to this, because this bullet is of soft lead, it would mushroom out. It would form a much uh, larger hole. They did need a second assistant to stabilize the limb that was going to be amputated. So there would be an assistant to hold onto this leg, uh, make sure that it was at the correct angle so that when the surgeon does the cutting, that saw doesn't get into a bind. There was a third assistant who would be in charge of the brass screw tourniquet. This is going to keep our patient from bleeding to death while he's on the operating table. A lot of people know that they didn't sterilize the instruments. Another problem that was equally as bad is that often the instruments were not as sharp as they were supposed to be. So instead of getting a nice clean incision, it was often more of a ripping and tearing that went on. But the Catlin knife was used simply to cut through the skin. And let's say that our patient uh, is, say that our patient was wounded here. We're gonna move up slightly above that wound and make an incision in the skin. And then that skin would be peeled back. The surgeon would then take a scalpel and use the scalpel to cut through the next layer of flesh, the muscles and tendons. And that incision would ma be made slightly further up the leg. And again, uh, the cut would be made all the way around and then that flesh is going to be peeled back. Now we're ready for the capital bone saw and that is what was used to sever that limb. And the assistant here who was stabilizing this leg, take that leg, throw it into a pile with all the other arms and legs that had been uh, cut off that day. After the leg has been severed, after that bone has been cut, the surgeon would take this device, a tenaculum, and use this to grab a hold of uh, arteries and blood vessels. And they're elastic, they tend to retract and go back into the body. The tenaculum was used to hook those vessels, pull them out, and then the surgeon would ligate them or tie them off using either silk thread or horsehair. After the ar arteries were ligated, the surgeon would then make sure that the end of that bone was smooth. There may be some shards left behind. So the surgeon would take these gnawing forceps or bone nippers and just nip off any jagged pieces of bone. Then he might take a bone file and smooth off the end of that bone so that it's nice and smooth. When the surgeon cut, he cut skin, then he cut muscle, then he cut bone. So what you end up with is a flap of muscle and skin that hangs down beyond the bone and that forms the stump. That will be a cushion uh, against the end of that bone. About 25,000 Confederate soldiers returned to their homes having suffered the amputation of a limb. Some of these veterans consider their missing limbs something of a badge of honor and proudly displayed their empty sleeves. Others felt less than whole and wanted to appear like their old selves. 
Private individuals and companies found plenty of business manufacturing artificial limbs. North Carolina's state government established a revolutionary program to provide prosthetic limbs for amputees, which other state governments later duplicated. Some of these limbs were very simple and inexpensive and were little more than wooden stumps, while others were more elaborate and realistic. Although these prostheses often caused pain or discomfort for veterans, they offered the opportunity for their wearers to lead a more normal life.